And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Chiron, who you may have heard <laughs> once or twice during this uh, uh, meeting. Um, it's, uh, it's both, I think, for me, uh, uh, an honor and certainly a pleasure to work with Anat so many years. Um, uh, I think she, she has made a, a really unique contribution to treating patients and helping them and building uh, certainly the best center in the Middle East and perhaps uh, in, uh, one of the best in the world. And um, uh, she's going, and just one more word, I think uh, uh, she's excellent in, in all what she does, uh, from molecular research to uh, uh, making sure the patients get the best uh, physiotherapy and the best uh, occupational therapy and so forth. And I think one of the things that I, <coughs> I myself f uh, feel lacking in, and she's very good in, is to, to pick up these subjects like this present conference, which go beyond the blood sugar level and the things that uh, we simple neurologists tend to, to uh, stay locked into and look at everything in a much wider context and uh, try and bring new ideas in, into the field. So, Anat. So thank you, Professor Chapman, for your kind words. And uh, I really think that uh, all of us here, having at least one thing that um, are keeping our brain very sharp is that we are um, treating patients, so we are um, taking care to do empathic things and to do things <laughs> for others. Um, and this is something that gives us at least, in a way, advantage. So I would like to speak today about neurogames and how they can modulate brain plasticity. And um, this is um, something that actually brings me back to feel younger. Because when we play, um, we often uh, remember our younger days. And I saw you all t yesterday in the workshops, and I really was enjoying it because you were really um, looking like a kindergarten. Although you did, although you did a lot of uh, really uh, <laughs> very difficult thing and uh, used your cognition, so. So, the first question, can cognitive impairment be improved? And uh, this is a really important question because um, this is the subject of our work uh, or our conference today. And you see this person that um, he's uh, using his brain to actually manipulate all his uh, efficient time and uh, working with all the instrument. And maybe in the future, um, we will have such abilities. But I would like to go to what I think uh, can improve our cognition. And we know that <coughs> practice makes perfect. So we know this sign from Nike that um, if you want to do something, you have to do it and then do it again and again and again, and sometimes again and again. And fortunately, we will be able to make perfect. We, we know that if we look at physical exercises and we do a lot of rehabilitation uh, with our patient. So I looked for the evidence of whether physical exercise training in multiple sclerosis can really be effective. And um, I can tell you that uh, I was surprised because there were many studies, and I would like to cite from a big review that was published uh, in 2012 by uh, Motel and uh, his collaborators. And uh, in, this, in their study, they suggested that physical exercise training in MS is um, affecting inflammation and neurodegeneration. Suggestive, because they did not have real data. And they also suggested that uh, uh, training is proposed to induce beneficial effect on muscle strength, on aerobic capacity, walking performance, gait, balance, and fatigue. 
So we know it because we always ask our patient to practice and we know it from ourselves because anyone that is doing some physical training knows that he is improving um, his balance, his gait, whatever. Um, so take going from there, um, looking at uh, physical activity to cognition. So does physical activity improve not only our muscle strength and our uh, gait or balance, but can it enhance cognitive performing? And this is a stu study published in 2014 where they looked at 212 patients uh, with MS and they assessed them by actigraph, which is um, a kind of a small instrument that you put on your hand and it can you know, measure your uh, activities. Uh, this they did for seven days. And what they found is that subjects that actually do physical activity have, as you can see here, better performance either on the PASAT or the symbol digit modality test. Similar study was done uh, looking at aerobic fitness. And in this study, they looked at uh, different areas of the brain. And you can see here the gray matter the, the, um, that is shown in yellow and in green uh, areas uh, with, um, uh, that this area were better preserved in patients that are performing physical activity. Um, and both the gray matter and the white matter tract integrity were associated with better physical Perform a physical performance, not physical, sorry, cognitive performance on a various tests and they, in this study they measured, or the, the two tests they measured actually reflect <coughs> some processing speed. So this study and similar other study, there were just a few examples show that MS patients that perform physical training have better cognitive performance. And I want to stress this point, they didn't show that um, physical activity improve cognition. They show that when you do physical activity, you have better cognitive performance. So my question is, could it be that those MS patients that are able to perform physical activity have less severe disease uh, and therefore their cognitive performance is better? Um, and this is an open question because um, it's important to understand what we are measuring. So, going further, can physical training improve cognitive function? And um, I didn't find studies on that. There was a nice uh, review coming from uh, Dr. Calron and Dr. Zelig, actually from Shiba, from the neurohabilitation, where they looked at a systematic review and looking uh, for studies that evaluated the efficacy of physical exercises in multiple sclerosis, stroke, and Parkinson. And they found only eight controlled clinical trials that, uh, uh, in multiple sclerosis that evaluated whether uh, physical training will improve cognition. Unfortunately, due to lack of communality between these studies in relation of what they measure in cognition, what were the training sequences, so how many times patients uh, were trained, what was the intervention period, is it enough to follow the patient for seven days or you need three months. Uh, it remained unclear whether exercise training can be effective to improve cognitive function. So al although I was a little bit devastated, I think it's an open field and um, all of us can look better into this um, option of new area of studies in the future. <coughs> so I will um, go over to suggest that what we want to see whether cognitive training could improve cognition in MS and um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what is cognitive training because cognitive training is actually a non-biological treatment that means that maybe we will need less, um, you know, IRB conference and less uh, FDA studies to, to go through, but still we need to do a research properly. So this non-biological treatment is aimed to improve cognitive skill, actually through brain training and through repeated cognitive exercises. 
the rationale of brain training is to induce brain plasticity by reorganizing the structure and function of related brain connection. And um, I know that later this day you will hear a, a, a beautiful lecture by uh, Professor Hanan talking about <coughs> neuroplasticity. But I will give you some indication about the pathogenesis of cognitive plasticity in multiple sclerosis and uh, already in 1996, uh, Demerens uh, reported about myelination and showed that it could be enhanced by increasing electrical activity of neighboring axons. And this clearly links the neuronal ec electrical activity to myelogenesis, suggesting that if we will do any processes that will enhance the uh, electricity in our axons, we will maybe enhance myelin production. What about cortical reorganization? It was also was reported uh, by Stefan in 2002 that increased recruitment of cortical network within adjusted brain areas may operate as an adaptive mechanism and compensate to decrease cognitive performance. So these processes of functional plasticity could lead to further synaptic proliferation and increase cortical thickness, which is definitely related to better cognitive performance and uh, therefore could be suggestive of a, a, a positive process in our brain and specifically for our patients. The significance of cogn cognitive plasticity was shown already early in the disease process. And we have uh, heard yesterday uh, by uh, uh, a, a wonderful lecture from Professor Inglés about the ability of our brain to increase the thickness of specific cortical areas that actually could reflect plasticity-related processes that could be associated with anatomical changes and therefore will lead to better cognitive performance. Uh, Roca in 2003 showed a functional MRI study whereby MS patient with many T2-weighted lesion demonstrated cortical reorganization over a specific sensory motor work they had to do. Smith et al. in 2009 also reported of increased brain activation in MS patient during response inhibition by fMRI, again suggesting that MS does not affect the ability of the brain to compensate or reorganize with increasing demand. And we know that actually the brain of MS patient is uh, affected, therefore there is all the time the new process or ongoing process of trying or trials of the brain to reorganize itself. So can we really enhance cognitive plasticity? And uh, this important question is because cognitive training is actually a simple, w a simple process. We all know and we heard, and this is the topic of our meeting, that cognitive decline in MS is not responsive to the current pharmacological intervention. And uh, Professor Amate have, sh have showed you yesterday that all the immunomodulatory drugs that we are treating today, uh, we have only scarce information or knowledge about their possibility to uh, reduce a cognitive progression. And of course this occurs, uh, the, the neuromodulatory, the immunomodulatory drug of course can reduce the inflammation and thereby maybe arrest disease progression. But we still don't have any direct drugs that will reduce um, the process of axonal loss uh, and myelin loss directly and not indirectly. Cognitive training, on the other way, is an attractive option as it may specifically target the relevant impaired cognitive domain. So if we have a patient that have a problem in a specific task, maybe we can direct our training specifically to this task. Uh, and additionally, cognitive training is not invasive. It has no relevant adverse events and it is estimated it's a low cost relatively to what other things that uh, we use. And 
And I want to show you some of the studies because uh, Professor Ramate has also already published in 2014, I think, a wonderful study because she was at least one of the first of the studies that I found that looked at computer-assisted rehabilitation to improve attention in patients with multiple sclerosis. And they took patients that failed. So this patient, MS patient that already had some impairment uh, in their attention, so they, they took um, two tests of attention that the patient did not perform well, and they randomized the patient to 55 patients that received specific attention training, and 33 patients that uh, received uh, non-specific computerized uh, training. And this was done in a one-hour session twice a week for three months. Uh, the finding showed a benefit of the specific attention training on the PASAT, uh, and this is really encouraging. Although the problem, the program trained for several attention components, improvement was exclusively on, on a task of sustained attention, but it is a start because we can see that if we practice, maybe we can have improvement. <coughs> Another study that I want to show you was published by Chira Valotti, I hope I pronounced it well, in 2000, in two, huh? Kia Valotti? Kia Valotti. Kia Valotti. In 2013, and he did a, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in 80... Masiti? <coughs> So he did a double-blind study on 86 MS patients, 41 were in the training group, 45 were in the placebo control group. All were evaluated at baseline with um, some <coughs> comprehensive neuropsychological assessment, and they performed a long-term follow-up for six months. The intervention was modified story memory technique, which is a 10-session behavioral intervention, teaching context and imaginary to improve learning and memory. And this was done for five weeks. However, the follow-up and assessment was done till six months. Um, the findings show that the training group had improved their learning slope relatively to the placebo, and the post-treatment improvement also continued for this specific task of least learning and self-reported on uh, measures up to six months. And this study suggested as a class one evidence that behavioral intervention can improve memory, uh, everyday memory in MS patient if it was done for five weeks and the training effect lasted uh, for a period of six months. So this may suggest that we should continue practicing. Uh, and the final study I want to show you is a study by uh, Mattioli. So um, I think the Italian group are very active in uh, doing uh, cognitive rehabilitation. And they again showed uh, um, some uh, efficacy on attention and executive function. They took again 20 MS patients that um, were assigned to the study group or the control that did not receive the, um, the training. And they did uh, the, co the cognitive rehabilitation for three months using intensive computer platform. It was done on an individual basis. Uh, each session lasted for one hour, and they did three sessions per week. The session consisted of computer training of attention, information processing, and planning of exercise for executive function. So this type of, uh, of training was a little bit more wide in its um, in its scope, and uh, again showing that uh, the treatment group that did specific training improved test of attention and information processing in executive function. So the question that I have still to raise from this study is, is that um, cognitive training is important, but we need to find out whether cognitive improvement in cognitive function derived from the training is really translated to improvement in real-world functioning among our patients. 
This is to say that if I practice, for instance, Sudoku every day, and uh, maybe I will improve my abilities in Sudoku, so the next time or the third time I will do it, I will do it faster or with a better outcome. But does it mean that I will also improve my executive function in uh, problem solving and, and everyday life in um, arriving to the hospital faster or going home faster? So this is a question that we need to know whether our uh, practicing is relevant to our daily life. And um, this was my encounter with uh, Happy Neuron, which occurred um, several years ago, because I looked for neuro games that will enable um, my patients to do cognitive training. And uh, believe me, I looked in uh, many sites in the, in the website, uh, and there are many platforms of uh, different companies that suggest for, for people to improve their performance. Um, so I want to thank Happy Neuron for being here and uh, performing the workshop yesterday. But this is uh, really because you are doing something I think is outstanding. And your um, platform, um, to my opinion, is much better to anyone that I saw in the internet. Um, because w you are enabling the exact measure, not only of the accuracy of the performance, but also the time. Uh, and this is a real advantage. Um, many of the platforms that doesn't, do not uh, um, uh, offer that. And um, in a mess, I think, the, the process of measuring time performance, because we know what happens in, um, in, in, our my, in the myelin of our patients with a prolonged um, latency times, I think this is very important. So it was Im important for me, and I think it's imperative to develop and validate mechanisms for e effectively treating cognitive dysfunction in MS patient. And I think that evaluation of brain training using specific cognitive game is important in order to design for our patients personal cognitive training platform. And this should be done in accordance with each patient cognitive performance. So, and just to remind you what we have seen yesterday, uh, in each game that we have in uh, the Happy Neuron platform, there we can actually select constant parameters that um, could be related to the number of, in this game, Slate of Hands, which is uh, my most beloved game because I think it, you remember yesterday with the right hand and the left hand, and it means that the corpus callosum is working very, uh, very intensively because it needs to do a lot of work. And uh, so we need to, to find what happens with the number of hands. We can uh, define, predefine the type of hands, whether it will be only hands uh, in, in, uh, alone or hands in action, so it ho is holding something, uh, maybe both types. Uh, could it be, uh, what will be the presentation and what will be the display time that you see and the, the, your answer time. So in the first study that we did and which the results I want to show you is we first pre-selected uh, these parameters so we will have a normalization for all patients. So even patients that maybe perform better, all, all actually performed on the same uh, process. And you can see here, you remember, this should be the right hand. And here, because you see the blue one, this means a mirror image. So if you decide that it is uh, the left hand, you should, again, change your idea and put the right cursor uh, to say this is the right answer. And so we uh, pre-selected the constant parameter and then measured the accuracy and performance of the time. And um, the idea was that we wanted to examine the correlation between the go cognitive games with cognitive performance and brain MRI lesion load. We wanted to define what are the relevant variables that we can rely on in our future assessment of the patient to evaluate neurocognitive benefits from the training. And we wanted to construct a, a scientific-based platform that will enable us to target task-related cognitive training. So here it was the study design, and the, the idea was to use the Happy Neuron platform, 
the cognitive testing was done by uh, the battery of neurotrucks. Again, you have seen it tomorrow, which is <coughs> yeah, yesterday. <laughs> yes, maybe I'm thinking already about the future. <laughs> Uh, so, and on the, um, the same period of time, which was around six months, we performed also a MRI with high re resolution 3 Tesla um, in this, um, in this uh, study. So, I want to show you the study population. Uh, we enrolled into the study 133 patients. Um, you can see that the, their age was 36. The disease duration was around eight years. Uh, their EDSS was not very high. Um, most of them, 60% were treated with immunomodulatory drugs. And the global cognitive score was 95. What do you think after the workshop yesterday? Is it good? Is it... Ellie, what do you think? Is 95 good? Not good enough, yes. Because we know that 100 is the mean. So the group as a whole performed below what is expected for their age and education uh, normal population. Still, uh, it is um, something that is not evident in their daily life. So there is no complaints of cognitive decline. But already they perform below the mean. And um, these these are the results of their neuro games. And again, I want to show you these uh, green, green uh, signs. What do they mean? What do you think they mean? This is the accuracy <laughs> that the patient perform using the games. And you can see that in some of the games that now you have already um, saw yesterday, for instance, basketball in New York, um, the score was was not very good, okay? So it was, they did not perform, did they did not perform well? Uh, or maybe one of my suggestions is that it is a very difficult game. So a priori, um, there are games that are more difficult to the patients and maybe they need to uh, practice uh, more in them. And there are um, like the Tower of Hanoi where they scored better. And um, just to show you also the, the pattern of cognitive performance, um, as you know, the global cognitive perf um, score was 95. And you can see that in most, most of the states, except for motor skill, uh, which is almost in, in the mean, they performed, and also visual spatial was in the mean, uh, they performed be a little bit below the mean. And the most impaired was, again, the information processing speed, which they performed uh, a little bit less uh, as compared to the other domains of the cognitive uh, assessment. So taking together what we wanted to see is what is the correlation between the game performance and the uh, cognitive assessment. And uh, I just show you that um, some of the games, you can see here an example for slate of hands, correlated to information processing speed and executives function both in time and accuracy. Uh, and similarly, untangled figures and uh, under pressure. Um, so some of the games correlated just in accuracy, some just in time, and some in both. And this is to suggest that if we are looking at um, a kind of a platform whereby we want to um, enhance information processing speed or executive function, then we can uh, pick from the list uh, those games that are really relevant to what we want to achieve with our patient. And just to show you what we have found with uh, the correlation between the cognitive game and the MRI lesion load, and again, it maybe is um, intuitive to say that, um, uh, of course, if um, T1 lesion lo load is uh, higher, then of course uh, the score, the time that is needed to perform the game will be increased. So slate of hands, again, as we suggested, a, a test that the test information processing speed, um, there was need more, um, the, the, the time was related to um, the T2, T1 
and also T2 lesion volume. And this is to, su to suggest that you can see that in some games there was no correlation to the MRI lesion load. Again, if we want to see the performance over time and maybe use MRI or maybe functional MRI, we better test those that have some correlation. And I was also happy to see that gadolinium, for instance, which uh, did not correlate to any of the games. It would be surprising if it would, uh, because I would not assume that anything would be um, related to some active, um, active disease process. And currently, uh, we are uh, designing the next step of the cognitive uh, training approach in order to evaluate the game training on a, on a long-term run in MS patients. And um, our study design is to include 130 patients uh, that will be randomized two to one to use cognitive games <coughs> platform by the Happy Neuron or not for a period of six months. Uh, this study will use um, 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 an evaluation period and I will show you some results uh, from the evaluation period. And I think that uh, you can see that uh, the training will take about one month. So we want to be sure that the patient understand uh, uh, what, what is going uh, on with the games and how they respond because they will be able to do it at home. Uh, and to use the platform in their own um, better way. Um, and we will do a assessment of uh, neurological disability and the uh, neuro status at the baseline. We will do the training and then after 12 weeks we will do, um, we'll continue the assessment and we'll uh, follow the patient for, uh, for six months, but we will do an inter-trim analysis at three months. Um, and we will do it with uh, the RabiSmart new platform. So this will enable the patient uh, at least uh, to, to follow and be followed uh, over the study period. Um, and the inclusion criteria is, um, of course, a diagnosis of MS. A patient will have either relapsing, remitting, or secondary progressive. You can see the, the age uh, range. Uh, but it will be important that uh, the patient will have at least some cognitive impairment because the idea is to improve. If you don't have, you are lucky, you are resilient, as Dr. Harrell will show you. Uh, so the patient should have impairment in information processing speed uh, and or executive function. And of course, uh, we will find that they will have no depression. Um, the, the, just to show how it works, the patient will start playing if he has a success in a specific level, which is the level that is appropriate for him. He will continue to a second practice session, success, he will continue. And this um, will enable him, if he fails, to repeat the, uh, the practice again and again. In order that the patient will not be bored, we will have a kind of randomization in the selection of the game. And so from time to time, they will have, of course, different game and uh, different uh, games on the turn. Um, and um, all this will be recorded. Um, and I just show you, want to show you how it goes. Because I think the ability to follow the patient in the adherence and compliance to the games is very important. Um, here is the, the, the way that it looks in the computer. So our psychologists can follow up and see uh, and decide which day the training will be performed, how much will be the workout, and the number of repetition for each exercise. And again, uh, for the benefit of the study, all this will be predefined and all patients will be asked to practice. Um, for the same workout duration, as I said, and the same uh, times per week. And I want to, share, to show you a patient and how he practiced. This is an online workout information. Um, and this is the opportunity to thank uh, Roy Aloni, our uh, psychiatrist who is working a lot with cognitive games for his uh, um, giving me the slides and uh, working with the patients. Thank you, Ray. And, uh, and uh, you can see here, this is uh, the first week the patient started practice. You can see the, the clock and it is green. This is to say that the patient practice and 
did the practice uh, as he was should. Uh, he didn't finish the practice, therefore the next day he did some more practice to finish what he didn't uh, achieve on, on the first, uh, the day before. And this also occurred on the second week. But look what happened on the third week. No practice. He was maybe going abroad, but didn't take his computer. I don't know. The next week maybe he got a phone from Roy because Roy is taking care to follow, and he did practice on <laughs> on the, this Tuesday, the 33rd of June. <coughs> Unfortunately, on the 25 again, no practice. So this is important because many of the studies uh, that um, were done so far follow the patients just by asking them if they practice. And uh, we know from our experience with immunomodulatory drug that unfortunately the adherence is not very high. So it is estimated, let's say, with the ABC R drugs, and that the injection rate is reduced over time and 25% uh, of the patient will not be compliant as they should be. And um, I just want you to think if you would agree that, let's say, your wife or your husband will not be compliant to you for 25% of the month. What do you think? Um, this is actually <laughs> what I call compliant, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's say um, that uh, at least he will come to sleep every night at home, something like that. Um, and, um, and this is a question or another example that I give because uh, to my patient when I ask them to be compliant either to the immunomodulatory drugs that cost a lot of money and then the patient come and he did not inject at least five, per, five times per month. Do you agree with it? No, we don't agree. We want him to inject for the whole month. So I always tell the story, if you have a department, a, an apartment that you rent, okay? And you get every month, you get the rent for let's say $1,000. But the next month, your, the, the person that lives in your rented apartment comes to you and he says, listen, I don't have the $1,000. I can give you only 750 You know, because I'm not compliant and I'm not adherent. Would you agree? So when I talk with my patient, they understand immediately when it's money things. And uh, less good is the husband example, anyway. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that we need to take care that they will perform the practice. And I think uh, kinds of platform like Happy Neuron enable us to follow the patient and be sure that they are uh, practicing. Otherwise, sometimes maybe some of the studies are not good enough uh, in terms of results because actually the patient didn't practice and we never knew it. We asked him uh, by phone call or, or by um, interview and they said, yes, we practiced. They forgot that this and this and they, they, this, this week was never... In addition, what we can see is the, the difficulty level. So you can see that in turn around and around, the patient performed in a, in a four level, which is a high level, while in points of view, he was only in two. So this was a more difficult. And here, as we saw before, basketball in New York is really a more difficult one. So they, had a, a, they are only on level one. And we can see also the accuracy and the time that they used to uh, practice uh, their achievement in each game. Okay, and this is again uh, just to show what is the uh, achievement of uh, one of, of the patient that practice. So this is how you can see and you follow the patient and you can see what are the games that he's less good at and probably correlate this finding to his uh, cognitive performance. And uh, as we said, slate of hands is relatively very sensitive to information processing speed and executive functions. So I would like to conclude my lecture by saying that uh, we need a future evaluation of brain cognitive training programs 
Uh, and this is very important to enhance neuroplasticity and improve cognitive performance in our patients. But it is of real importance to assess whether training will improve the related cognitive function and not only the tested variables. And this is the opportunity to thank to all my collaborators and, um, and I think you can see here Roy and Karen and Tali that did all the cognitive assessment and cognitive games and uh, to Professor Frank Tarpin and his team and of course to Professor uh, Ellie Simon and um, Dr. Uh, Doninger for their help in uh, NeuroTracks. And thank you for your attention.